in my previous video, I defined a lot of the concepts and notation that we're going to be using in forecasting. So what I'd like to do in this video is to um, develop three very simple models that I'm going to refer to as baseline models uh, that illustrate these concepts and the notation and how we do it in R. So th the way I'd like to do this is rather than just giving you the method, I'd like to start with a statistical model that um, kind of gives rise to the method. So let's start with a white noise process possibly shifted uh, by, um, by some constant C. Okay, so in other words, all of my observations y i y t uh, are just some constant plus a white noise process. And I remember the white noise process has mean zero, variance sigma squared, and uh, the errors are uncorrelated. These white, these white noise errors are uncorrelated. So what happens uh, in this model, we can, we can derive some very simple um, uh, properties of this. Um, what we know is that the mean of our y's will then be c. So how do I know that? Well, um, this is my model. So c plus epsilon sub t. If I take the expected value of this, what we have is c plus the expected value of these epsilons, epsilon sub t, and we've assumed that to be zero. Therefore, um, on the average, we're going to get c. You know, so, so basically, the, the, the picture that we have is, um, oops, it's supposed to be a normal curve there. This is my distribution of y, where the mean is c. Um, the other thing we know is the variance of these is just equal to the variance of my epsilons, which is sigma squared. So when I uh, add a constant to something, that doesn't change the variances. And so that c goes away. So the variance of this distribution is going to be sigma squared. All right, so we've just established this. So how do I forecast future values of, of y? So I, I, let's say I've, I've observed capital T of these. What do I think the next value is going to be? Well, since this is white noise. There's nothing systematic going on here. Um, the, the best thing I could do is simply average uh, these, these, uh, these t values, and that's going to be my best value, but my best forecast uh, for, for any uh, observation in the future. So for any h, if I go t plus 1 or t plus a million, um, the, the, the best uh, forecast value is just going to be the mean of the training set. All right. Now what I'd like to do is to work through a lot of the concepts that I defined in the previous video for this extremely simple model. Um, so, so the model being this, uh, you know, the white noise process and the average method forecast. So the, the first thing that we defined was a residual. And so the residual in this case is um, just y sub t minus y bar. Y bar is you know, the, the forecast value. Now then, I need to summarize the standard deviation of these. So uh, how, how, you know, what, what is the, the, uh, the, the typical amount that we're off by? And so we'll just call that sigma hat. So this would be RMSE for um, the, these residuals. Um, okay, now, what I'd like to be able to do is establish a window for how far my forecast value is from the true value in the future. So th this is going to be called the variance of our prediction error. So what's sitting in here is the prediction error, and I want to know what is the typical squared size of this. And that's like the typical amount that I'm off by in squared units. Well, this is um, very easy to, uh, to compute with my model. So 
let's let's go through this carefully. Y in the future, so T plus H, um, is independent of my first uh, T cases that are used to compute Y bar. The reason I know that is because it's a white noise process. There are no autocorrelations here. So because these two are independent of one another, I can just distribute the variance sign. Now the only thing that we have to worry about is this minus. So that minus, um, let me just kind of refresh your memory of this. If I have the, the variance of ax plus by, that's going to be a squared times the variance of x plus b squared times the variance of y plus 2ab times the covariance of x and y. All right, now in our case, this is 0. And my b is minus 1, but it gets squared, so um, it, it becomes a plus. So when I take the variance of y sub t plus h, uh, oops, that should be a minus y bar, this is just going to be the variance of y t plus h plus, because that thing, that minus 1 gets squared, the variance of y bar. And so this is just sigma squared. This is just sigma squared over capital T. All right, so I've now uh, established this result that I stated in the course packet. Uh, let me just mention, um, th this is exactly what you should have learned back in, in the basic stats course that you took um, when there was a, a section on the prediction interval for the mean. So if, um, if you don't remember that or if it wasn't covered in your class, um, go watch my video. Um, so you can just click on that link here. All right, so this is just telling me um, how much are my, my, my forecasts going to be off by. Now, we can establish a prediction interval um, using this variance. So if my data comes from a normal distribution, then I can use a normal or t distribution to compute the prediction intervals. And so the idea is we're just going to go out some number of these standard deviations. So what do I mean by these standard deviations? Well, we're going to estimate the sigma squared by taking this sigma hat that I estimated up here and just dropping that in, and then the square root of, of this. Um, so, so this whole piece is the variance of my prediction error square rooted, and this is going to be some number of standard deviations in either direction. So this works great as long as you have normal data. If you don't have normal data, um, you're going to need to use another approach called the bootstrap method, which doesn't assume the normality. All right, let's now illustrate this in R. So R has a really well-designed um, forecasting package that makes your life real easy. So make sure you've locate, loaded the forecast library. Um, I showed that back in the, the first uh, the second video of, of this um, introduction. So in order to illustrate this, I decided I would generate 20 random values, and you can replicate those uh, if you set the seed as I did. And let's say I want to use this average method to predict the next five periods. So I need to use some forecasting function the forecast library uh, implements this average method with the mean f function. So if I say mean f, give it my time series, my training data. So y has my training data in it. And I say, give me the forecast for the next five periods. Um, this is the fitted object that I get. So what you're going to see is I get predictions, or I shouldn't call them predictions, forecasts for periods 21 through 25. Now, what you'll see is that these forecasts are all the same because, you know, going back to this, uh, I, you know, there's no trends or seasonality or anything to, to, to account for. So my prediction of every future value is just the mean. So that's why they're all the same. Um, there are a lot of components of this fitted object. And uh, I, you know, we'll be going over these in, in subsequent videos. Another thing that I want to cover with you is the plotting functions. I think the plotting functions are really easy to use. This autoplot y generates 
the original observed training data. And so when we see the black squiggle over here, that's the original data. Now I can add a layer to this just with plus auto layer. And if I give it the fitted object, it's gonna superimpose the fitted values for periods 21 through 25. And so this uh, solid line, this, this horizontal line, represents those predictions. The, um, the, sh the dark shaded region is the 80% prediction interval. The light shaded region is the 95% uh, uh, prediction interval. And so the interpretation here is 95% of future values are going to fall between, uh, you know, within that, that light shaded area. Uh, 80%, so four out of five, will be in this uh, dark shaded region, according to my model. I always think it's a good idea to, um, to try to implement models, quote, by hand, just so that we really understand what's, what's going on with them. So let's go do that. If I take the mean of y, I get 0 0.0765, and that's exactly what my forecast was. Let's go try this prediction interval formula that I, that I derived on the previous page. And so we'll take the mean plus or minus some t statistic. And so in this case, I'm going to use the 90th percentile to get the 80% 80, 80, uh, 80 prediction interval. Why the 90th percentile? Well, um, just a, a quick review. This is the 90th percentile. And what that means is there's 10% of the area in that tail. Now, if I go to a, you know, a symmetrical tail on the other side, I also get 10%, which means there's 80% in the middle. So that's why I'm using the 90th percentile when I construct this 80% um, pr uh, prediction interval. And so the, the point is, uh, I get exactly the same value that R did, and so I, I've convinced myself that I understand what R is doing. If I want the 95% uh, prediction interval, everything's the same except I'm going to use the 97.5 percentile instead of the uh, 90th percentile. And notice the answer is exactly what we get, and that doesn't change over time. Okay, one more thing that I want to go over with you. And so I said that we need certain properties on these residuals. The residuals ought to have mean zero. The residuals uh, should be uncorrelated. So those were two um, hard assumptions that we need all the time. We also um, care about whether the residuals have normal distributions and constant variance. There's a very nice function that goes with the forecasting library called check residuals. And so I like to think of this as like the plot function for an LM object. So when you plot an LM object, it gives you all the diagnostics that you're supposed to look at. This is going to give us all the diagnostics that we're supposed to look at for time series objects. Let's start with the, um, the plot. Uh, the, well, let's, we went over these, I guess, in my couple videos ago. Um, here we're looking at the residuals plotted over time. And so there are no patterns. So we don't have a whole lot of values that are systematically positive and then systematically negative. And the residuals are pretty nicely centered around zero. The ACF is telling me there are no strong autocorrelations, so nothing to worry about there. The prediction intervals that I'm computing require normality. My uh, histogram doesn't reveal any gross departures from normality, so uh, it looks like all of these things are, are working. Um, we also get the uh, Young box test, and this would be just for the first autocorrelation. I could set that for more if I wanted to. The p-value is pretty large, so 0.7, so I can't reject the null hypothesis that the uh, auto, first autocorrelation equals zero. So uh, basically there are no problems with this model. Um, everything's working as, uh, you know, as assumed. So None of our, our assumptions are in question. Let's move on. The um, next model that I'd like to talk about uh, is what's called the naive forecasting model. 
And as I did with the previous um, uh, model, uh, I'm going to start with a statistical model where this naive estimator makes a lot of sense. Now, this statistical model is extremely important and famous. Uh, whenever you take a time series class or a uh, you know, more advanced probability class, you're going to run into this model a lot. So it's something you should have heard of. So I'm going to assume that there's some initial level called a why not. And so that's where I start. I'm going to assume that epsilon is a white noise process. So the, the model that I'm considering is called a random walk model. So the random walk model uh, can be expressed in two ways. So one way is my current value is just wherever I was last time period plus a step in some random direction. So we could think of it something like this. Um, let's say that this is time and I have time equal to zero here and maybe this is my why not value. And so the whole idea is I'm going to draw a random number, and uh, let's say it's a positive random number. So white noise between, you know, mean zero and all that. And so I take a jump this way. All right, so now I'm standing here. Now I draw another random value from my uh, white noise process, and maybe it's a smaller positive number, and so I jump there. Then I draw another number, maybe I jump up here, and oh, now I got a negative value, and it's a pretty big negative value. Maybe I get another negative value, then I get a positive value. And so um, this would be a random walk. So what's really important is where I go next really only depends on where I was along with some random value. So that's a random walk. Random walks will tend to have a lot of autocorrelations with them. So they'll go up for a while, they'll go down for a while, um, and, and so they're, they're, they're typically fairly strong autocorrelations associated with a random walk. All right, another way that we could do this is um, recursively work this out um, as follows. So we, it's just the starting value plus all of these, these uh, random steps that I'm taking along the way. If I just add up the steps, that'll also get me there. So uh, two things to notice about this. First off, if I find the mean of this, well, the mean of this, uh, I think it's easier to see it using the right version of this, is just going to be y naught, which is a constant, plus the expected values of a bunch of um, random variables at a mean zero. So this term is just a sum of a bunch of zeros. And so um, the mean of this uh, random walk is going to be why not. Now, let's look at the variance. So the variance is also easily computed from this. All these errors are independent, so we don't need to worry about um, the covariance terms. Um, so I can just add up the variances of these individual ones. So if I go t steps out, um, the variance at that will be t times sigma squared. So in other words, the variance of a random walk is going to increase the more I wander around. Okay, so the further out I go, the, the greater the variance. So we, we talked about stationarity in the previous um, lecture. Random walks are not stationary, at least in the variance. Okay, now what I'd like to do is to... Um, discuss what happens when we do differencing. So I've, I've been talking a lot about the virtues of differencing, um, just kind of saying they're good, but um, now I'd like to really show you why differencing is so powerful. So let's go compute differences. And we can see what happens if we move y t minus one to the other side. So you get y, minus, y sub t minus y sub t minus one. And that's just what's left over is the white noise process. So by taking first differences, 
Um, I now have a very well well behaved uh, uh, random process, nice white noise process. So extremely important. Um, I've gotten rid of my non-stationarity in the variance by doing the differencing. Um, it, I've also gotten rid of the auto correlations that I alluded to. Um, so if you generate data from a random walk, you're going to see the auto correlations are large and, and problematic. Um, so by differencing, I can get rid of those problems. So this is um, kind of a really important technique that you're going to want to use throughout time series. Um, so we can take differences to um, uh, reduce our time series to something that's much simpler to handle. Then we go model that uh, and then transform back, as I, as I did, indicated in a previous video. All right, so that's the random walk. What should I do to forecast a future value. So in other words, let's say I'm here. This is time period big T. What do I think the next value will be? Well, I hope that um, it's kind of obvious that, uh, I, you know, uh, what I'm going to do is just add random noise. So um, maybe I'm above the value, maybe I'm below the value. On average, I, I'll have this value. So my best forecast is simply going to be the last value. So let me write this. Y hat, let's call this t plus 1. Uh, the best estimate is just going to be y t. So take my, my y t, which is this, and that's going to be my best estimate since what is y t plus 1? It's just y sub t plus this random uh, noise, which you know has has mean zero, so it's equally likely to be above or below it. So my best forecast is just going to be this value. Um, what happened prior to t doesn't help me at all. Okay, so the naive forecast model then is simply this: um, my future forecast of any number of periods out uh, is just the um, last value of t. I can't do any better than that. So that's our, our naive model. Well, we're going to go through the exact same steps that I took us through in the previous um, average model. The math isn't that bad for the average model in this, um, this random walk. Later on, the math gets difficult very quickly. So we're not going to be doing the math after this, but my hope is that if you can understand it for these simple models at a, at a kind of a deeper level, then your understanding of these concepts will kind of carry you through when we, um, we don't want to do the math because it's, it's too messy and hard. All right, so the next thing we need to know is what is the residual standard error, the standard deviation? So uh, this will be my estimator of that. Um, we'll just, you know, since I can't uh, make a forecast of time period one since um, a time period one estimates time period two. So we're just going to use these, um, these forecast errors. And um, notice I've got t minus one of these. And we'll have an extra degree of freedom for the estimate of the mean um, residual. The mean residual is not necessarily zero in like regression, so we have to estimate it. And so that's why I'm going to use t minus 2 as my degrees of freedom. So I've got t minus 1 observation minus 1 degree of freedom for the mean, and that's how I'm going to estimate the residual standard deviation. Well, let's go find the variance of the prediction error. So how far do I think that this, uh, th this value, h periods out, will be from my forecast value, which is y sub t. Well, again, um, we, we can go substitute the, um, uh, the formula in that, that we had up here. Um, the y sub t's cancel out, and I'm just left with a sum of uh, h of these, um, these errors. And therefore, 
the variance of the prediction error is just going to be h times sigma squared. So the textbook uh, states that formula. This is where it comes from. So we're going to be able to use the same basic approach. We're going to go some number of standard deviations out. Well, what's the standard deviation? It's just the square root of that thing we just computed. So we'll drop in uh, our estimate of the standard deviation as we did before, take the square root, and, and this is it. Let's now do um, an example. I'm going to go to the T-bill example. Remember this T-bill data ranged from 1970 through 2009. And so let's set up a training set and a test set. So I've um, kind of arbitrarily chosen my training set as the data through 2004. So from 1970 through 2004. And then I'll use the last five years as the um, test set. So from 2005 to 2009. And so now I have two new time series objects representing the training set and the test set. So the forecast library gives us a function called naive that does this naive estimator. So it just takes the most recent value. So if I apply naive to the training set and I say, give me forecasts for the next five periods, let me just take us over to R for a second. And I'll show you what, uh, what you get. So I just ran this. Um, you get the forecasts exactly as we got for um, the average method. You're going to see all the forecasts are the same, 1.37. Where does that come from? It's the last value of the training set. So I think we understand what's going on with this. Now, let's say I wanted to compute accuracy measures of this. If I just say accuracy for fit, it would give me the accuracy for the training set. If I pass it a test set, as I have here, you're going to see it gives me the, um, the values for both the training and the test set. And so here they are. And what we see is that um, it looks like the test set's doing a bit worse on all these measures that I talked about than the uh, training set. All right. I can make a plot of this. And so it's Kind of similar to what I had before. We'll use auto plot. Um, so this is going to give me the original training data. We'll add a layer with the predicted values. So this gives me the predicted values along with the prediction intervals. And then we'll add another layer with the observed um, test set values. And so you get, I think, a beautiful plot. Um, and here, here's our time series for the training set. This um, solid line is the naive estimator. Where does that come from? It's just the most recent value of the training set. We see the uh, observed value, which is uh, given in the green uh, line, and then we get our prediction intervals, our 80 and our 95% prediction intervals. And so uh, what we see here is um, the, the observed values fit within those prediction intervals. So it kind of looks like those prediction intervals are working. Now, usually when we fit a forecasting model, we don't just fit one model. We, um, we want to compare various models. So let's compare the naive model with the average model. So I'll use the mean f function to fit this model on the training set. We'll get the next uh, five predictions using this h equal to 5 argument. And so here are our, the uh, test set measures. And so what we'd like to do is to compare the uh, measures of, you know, RMSE, MAE, mean, mean absolute error, and, and, and MAPE. And so what we see is the naive method does uh, substantially better on this T-bill data than the average method. Now, I've done an auto plot just to compare the fits. So I'm going to compare the, the mean method with the... Um, with the uh, uh, well, actually, I'm, I'm, not doing, I'm not doing a comparison, but you can kind of compare the two plots. And you can see um, the average method is not doing very well because um, it's averaging all these values that happened long ago in the past. And that doesn't have a lot to say about what's going to happen next. And so um, you can see why all of our FIT statistics are saying the naive method was giving us a better estimate than the average method. All right, 
I'm now going to introduce one more model. Um, it's called the drift model in your, um, in your textbook. Um, I'll just mention that some textbooks call this the random walk model. Um, I'll call it the random walk with a drift term. So the, the difference um, um, is going gonna, is gonna to be as follows. So this is going to be the model, I assume, that gives rise to the data. So my value at time t is going to be where I was before plus some constant. Okay, so I'm going to go up by c. If c is negative, then I go down by that amount. But I always take a step of size t in one direction or the other. Then I also add a random step to c. Okay, so what, what's going to happen here is we're going to get something that's like a regression line. And so if I transfer this to the other format, what you see is it looks a lot like regression. So if I go over to um, my document camera, we can think of here is why not. And so systematically, the, um, this is going to change by C. The, the, there's going to be a trend um, uh, of, that's going to be linear in this case, and it changes uh, C units each, each time. So if C is zero, you just have a, the basic random walk that we just went over. Um, the only thing that uh, I want to mention about this is the variance is going to increase. Okay, so we have all these, these uh, you know, error terms that get added up. And so the further out I go, the bigger the variance is going to be. So uh, the random walk is going to kind of explode like this. The spread around it is going to keep getting bigger and bigger the further out we go. All right. So this is going to be a really useful model if we have a trend. So a couple things to note about this is notice here's your mean. So this looks a whole lot like regression. So it's like an intercept plus a slope times t. Um, but this mean changes uh, as t changes as long as c is not zero. Okay, so whenever there's a positive or negative slope, the, these means are changing. The variances are also changing. So what you say is, this is really a, kind of a difficult random process because it's not stationary in either the mean or the variance. Well, what we could do to address this is our, um, you know, our old trick differencing. So if I difference it, what do I get? Well, I get, um, I'll just move this term over, and I get a white noise process with a shifted mean. Okay, so in other words, this is a very simple uh, random process to handle. Uh, and so I can just take differences. That's going to get rid of the trend. It's going to get rid of the heteroscedasticity. It's going to get rid of the autocorrelations. So differencing is a big deal. Okay, how do we estimate C? Where, where do we get this C? Well, let's go back and look at what we had up here. And so when I take the differences, on average, the differences equal C. So why don't I just average the differences? And that would be a completely reasonable estimate of this slope. Um, it's kind of interesting to think why this works with time series, but what it doesn't really work with, um, with regression. Uh, with regression, our points aren't guaranteed to be equally spaced. Uh, and we may have a lot of like, you know, missing points, if you will. Uh, so you can't just compute differences and average them. But this is an extremely simple way to get at the estimate of the, of the uh, slope just by doing these differences. So this is going to be my drift estimator. Let's take the mean of the differences. So here's all my differences from this, you know, observation 2 through observation t. I've got t minus 1 of these. And um, this actually simplifies. Uh, so let me just uh, briefly show you how it simplifies. If we were to take the sum, uh, t equals 2 to big T of y sub um, uh, t minus y sub t minus 1, 
what this um, this really is is y sub three minus y sub two. Okay, that's the first term. So put two in there. Uh, oh, sorry. There we go. So for t equal to two, we get this. Um, then let's go put t equal to three in. So plus y sub three minus y two, and then plus well y sub four minus y sub three, plus all the way through um, y sub t minus y sub t minus one. And so what happens here is that minus y two cancels out with that one. Uh, this cancels out with that. This cancels out with the next one. This cancels out with this. And so we're just left with y sub t minus y sub 1. So computing the average of the differences is very simple. It's just this term. All right. So now we have our estimate of the slope. We want to go h steps of size, you know, the slope out from our last value. So that's our drift forecast method. So I've said this a couple times now, but um, it's such an important thing. I've, I've written it here. So our basic approach is we're going to difference to reduce to a white noise process. We'll, we'll estimate the mean with the simpler process. Then we can transform back uh, with, with this drift method. Let's go apply this to the T-bill data. So there's a function in R, um, the forecast library of R, called RWF for random walk forecast. Random for walk forecast with drift equal to true gives the drift model. If you say drift equal to false, then you just get the uh, naive model that I mentioned before. And so we can go look at our accuracy. Um, it'd be good to compare these with the, um, the other models. So I've um, done that on a piece of paper. So here's the average, the drift, and the naive. And what we see is that looks like naive is winning. So naive is winning, at least in RMSC and MAE. Um, and with MAPE, drift is winning. So just uh, that, that's the type of thing we would do is we'd be using the test set to make comparisons of these. Another thing that we would be doing is comparing the predicted values. So I've now made a fairly complicated plot where I have put all three models on the same plot just to um, emphasize the differences. So the green line is for the average method. And that's a horrible uh, estimator in this case because we have these autocorrelations. Both the random walks, so the simple naive one and the uh, one with the drift terms, I think do pretty well. Um, I prefer the, um, the uh, uh, naive one because I don't think there's a real trend here. Uh, so I think we have some cyclical stuff going on, but I don't think there's a long-term trend this thing's probably going to come back up at some point. Um, for that reason, I would go with the naive. But um, if we thought this is a long-term trend, then the drift model would be better. Okay, the last thing that I want to do in this video is to illustrate time series cross-validation. So I've written myself a little function that I can pass residuals to and compute uh, the mean error, the root mean squared error, and the mean absolute error. So um, because I'm going to be comparing all three of these models, what I'm, um, what I'm going to do is, is give myself a burn-in period. I need that burn-in period, certainly for the average method. Don't really need it for the naive method. I don't need much of a burn-in period I guess for the drift method, although I, you know, I, I would need to average some of these to, to get a reliable estimate of those differences of the slope. So um, just, just to illustrate this, let's say I use the first 10 observations as a burn-in period. So TSCV 
takes a time series, then some forecast method, and it's going to estimate that naive method in this case using the first 10 cases. So you're going to notice that what comes back is a time series where the first 10 cases are missing because I can't make a forecast value for those, uh, those training cases. But then I use those 10 cases to estimate the next one. I use the 11 cases to estimate the 12th case all the way through the, uh, the, the last case. So I can do this for the naive. Um, I, I call this for average and drift. Um, and so here are the uh, errors. And so what we'll see with this is it, um, it looks like now um, naive is still winning on RMSE. Drift is a, a close second. Average is pretty bad. Um, when it comes to mean absolute error, it looks like naive is winning by uh, just a little bit over drift. Uh, average is, uh, is, is, is doing very poorly. And so I think naive would be the, the best model in this case.